There's an internal conflict that drives my work between creating work for aesthetics and the process of sculpture and making work for a market and the politics of critiquing it. I'm striving to make sculpture that focuses on the surface, is desirable to look at, and manipulating this aspect of art for a consumer at the same time. My key themes are money and the art market, capitalism and materiality. The fine artist came to seem a near miraculous creator of value, transmuting relatively inexpensive materials into fabulously expensive commodities. Uh, art as an investable commodity, not as a piece of art, but purely on a sort of mathematical standpoint, has been one of the best asset classes for, I'm willing to bet, for the last 15 years. Money and the art market has become more than just something to critique for some artists. Within the essay, The Medium is the Market by Hal Foster, Foster compares balloon dogs' visual aesthetic to luxury gift packaging and explains the great production cost of the sculpture meant it could be sold at an even greater price, implying the industrial production process that is inherent with commercial artists connects art with luxury. Then going on to comment on how Hearst, for the love of God, was a glamorous jackpot due to its material value, which indicates something of the mortality of the art market and its reliance on hypervaluable commodity. Another key point within the text is that art is an asset that makes for a guaranteed investment even in times of financial hardship providing insight into contemporary society and explains how Andy Warhol could advocate business art. Within the essay, Foster analyses Christie's co-head of post-war and contemporary art, Amy Capellazzo's writing within Art Forum, who explains that this is due to insider trading and price fixing, which are illegal in other markets and are commonplace in the art market, meaning that the art market is essentially a flawed market system that could be taken advantage of. This text has allowed me to question whether art has become too involved with finance and selling. With Sotheby's price-fixing scandal that lasted from 2000 to 2002, which involved the fixing of commission rates charged to buyers and sellers, and therefore exploiting consumers, it appears the trust in this market had been shaken. Foster makes a key point within the text about contemporary art remaining highly exclusive and the public viewing it as a private affair, which allows me to question art's accessibility due to its increasingly commercial context. Contrastingly, one of the highest selling artists, Gerhard Richter, stated that the art market sales prices are out of control and worries that serious galleries and young artists were suffering as a result. Capitalism. This brings me to capitalism. Late capitalism is an epoch, our current stage of economic and political society, where commodification has perforated all areas of culture and everything is produced for financial gain. Theorist Frederick Jameson states, What has happened is that aesthetic production today has become integrated into commodity production generally. Here Jameson implies that within a capitalist society, art is treated as though it is a commodity, and this has in turn affected what kind of art is produced, perhaps specifically for a market, Within the book Money Artworks by Katie Siegel and Paul Matic, they define capitalism as the type of society where money plays a central role in the production and distribution of goods and services. This quote implies that money is the sole driving force behind production within our culture and society. For example, the overtly expensive artwork that is produced by Damien Hirst and Jeff Koons, specifically to achieve value, conforms to this capitalist theory. The book also states how capitalism honoured productive activities such as artistic labour. 
But if artists like any other productive occupation should expect a wage for their labour, then why is it so frowned upon to openly involve money-making in art? Joanna Drucker states within her book Sweet Dreams that if the artist is complicit within the market, it makes the viewer feel a level of guilt surrounding the work. And this is reinforced in the Maurizio Catalan documentary. An artist may be a real genius today, but if he is spoiled or contaminated by the sea of money around him, his genius will completely melt and become zero. If he's going around too much, then became a commodity. And we are not here to sell commodities. When Massimo Di Cairo states that the association with art being a commodity can do value in artwork by stating we are not here to sell commodities, this signifies that the word commodity contaminates art. Yet this is ironic when Don Thompson states in his book The Twelve Million Dollar Stuffed Shark, it's easier to appreciate art when what is required is not an understanding of art history, just your memory of a recent article about high auction prices implying that the accessibility of contemporary art is strongly connected with the accessibility of money. But within my own work, I'm critiquing this further by advertising my art openly, exposing it as the product it's perceived to be, as though to expose these issues. There is a strong link to financial value when we speak about the value of art, especially as Siegel and Matic state that art may be discussed more frankly in monetary terms rather than its spiritual terms, suggesting that although art should have some higher value, the financial aspect appears to be more of a point of discussion. However, Professor Paul Arden argues that for this epoch, the economy is an artist's concern and motivator of creativity. Still, there appears to be a link between the avant-garde and investment, where Siegel and Matic state that competing avant-gardes like Cubism and Surrealism exist simply because of the artist's motivation to be original and desired by the art market, rather than because of creativity. This dystopian point displays an extreme capitalist viewpoint about art being produced for a market. But if we look at Gerhard Richter, he talks about the chance involved with his abstract painting, stating he knows when one is complete when it exceeds him. This chance and quality adds value to his work, which could support his high market prices, but ultimately it's the connection with the process. Comparatively, Professor Immanuel Kant provides a contrasting historical context defining artistic activity as free and not performed for wages, thus elevating art to having come from a more utopian level. The basic model of an art that is prospective, that is speculative, I think is still important to hold on to. Otherwise, art just becomes another product within a market of products which is satisfying an audience or a public or a consumer. Here, curator Charles Escher is essentially stating that if art doesn't fulfill these prospective goals, like being an artistic platform of expression and not restricted to any market, then is it just a commodity? Although, Drucker argues that no matter how complicit art may appear within the market, it can never be advertising due to its element of critique. So even if art appears to be consumed by money and advertising like some of Jeff Koons' liquor ads do, or value like Damien Hirst's diamond encrusted skull, it's the process act of making fine art itself that gives those pieces enough authenticity to be fine art. Artworks came to be bought and sold in stores too. It thus expresses the duality of art as both a commodity and a symbol of non-commercial values. This duality of art is what interests me most. How can art be both? An artist that exploits this duality is Anya Hindmarch, who designs luxury silver and gold clutch bags in the forms of sculptural crisp packets, advocating wearable art, which have a high retail value due to their medium, and merges the boundaries between product and art by making luxury goods to satisfy a consumer.
Tate describes sculpture as three-dimensional art made by one of four basic processes, carving, modelling, casting and constructing. Maybe the value that sculpture has acquired comes from this more intrinsic level of making that is involved with an innate understanding of expression, or perhaps its value comes from how tangible it is as a medium when it comes to sale. Sculpture is one of the only two mediums, the other being two-dimensional works on paper or canvas, that most major auction houses sell under the heading of contemporary art, therefore making its medium naturally marketable. I define sculpture for my practice as the process of making a material three-dimensional and transforming a material from its original state to expose the details within the material for aesthetic effect. When it comes to materiality, money and value seem distant, yet Linda Benglis comments on consumer excess. Within the book Beyond Process by Susan Richmond, Benglis' material choice and surface texture is noticed for its aesthetic purposes, describing her aluminium piece, Eclat 1990, to have a rippled surface that reveals a variety of textures with some areas polished to a mirror-like shine. This visual aesthetic aspect connects to the pleasure in viewing and being consumed by the object. This quote describes the surface details of Benglis's urethane sculptures. These differences, subtle as they are, invite close looking, not least of which because they shift and transform under different ambient conditions. James Elkins talks about this human desire in looking in his book The Object Stares Back. Looking is possessing or the desire to possess. He explains how there is no looking without the thoughts of using, possessing, owning, keeping or appropriating, explaining the power that objects can obtain by being viewed. And this enjoyment in viewing equally connects to products within a store. There are similarities within Anish Kapoor's stainless steel sculptures, including Non-Object Square Twist 2013 and Sky Mirror 2006, which reference the aesthetic sublime, but the act of viewing a large reflective object is consuming for the viewer. The reflecting surface becomes the framework of virtual space and at the same time what disrupts it. Because of the medium, Kapoor's work contorts the way that you see the world in yourself, the surface changes depending on lighting conditions and the experience can't be repeated twice. Within Benglis's work, the details in the materials in this notion of aesthetic beauty engages the viewer. However, this could be likened to commodity culture, as critic Jeremy Gilbert Rolfe compares enjoying beauty and decoration to a trip through a shopping mall. So perhaps Benglis is commenting on consumer excess, like when she chose to exploit the medium of gold leaf at a time of economic instability for the 1970s gold markets and complicate the literal and perceived preciousness of her sculpture by using the contradictory structural materials like chicken wire alongside the gold. Frederick Jameson states, All beauty today is meretricious and the appeal to it by contemporary pseudo-aestheticism is an ideological manoeuvre and not a creative resource, connecting back to capitalism and suggesting that the market has conditioned the aesthetics of beauty and therefore what we see in art is an effect of this social construct. However, although Benglis's work critiques commodity culture, it is clear that she is enthralled by the material she uses. Benglis is a sculptor whose process can be described as in conversation with the material itself. There's different kinds of work, etc. Do you see your work as a, um, in series? A in language. The, a language in which you... Maybe a language. A I feel our bodies, our, our sensory perceptions, that's a material that I deal with, with the material in the context. So I feel I'm at one with the material, as Paula might have said, or as any artist says. I'm not depicting something. I'm making a feeling or I'm making a form. She speaks of her work as though it is a journey through materials and a choice of materials. 
The work is a language, and she describes her work as an expression of space. This is evident through the evolution of materials she has used, including latex, wax, metal, glass and ceramic, and particularly in her latex pores, where she literally brings the painting off the canvas into the architectural space. This could be equal to Anthony Caro's Early One Morning, where he compares the materiality in his work to the notes within a piece of music, which revolutionised the way we see sculpture. Finally, Benglis's works, including her ceramic sculptures that are made in New Mexico, reflect the environment that they are made in through the use of colour and process. And this implies that she is an artist that may also be working within this duality of art, between creating work for aesthetics and the enjoyment of the process of sculpture.